So I wonder this morning, how many of you remember um, the 1980s movie, Urban Cowboy? Amen. Of 1980. Um, in 1980, it was a little risque. I was in high school. My parents said I couldn't go see it. Thank you, God, for loving parents who, who said, you're, <laughs> you're looking risque. Come on, in 80, 1980, it was risque. People were like, whoa, wait a minute, that night. But in the, on the soundtrack of that movie was a song by Johnny Lee entitled Looking for Love. Come on, you remember that song. And, and it was a big hit, and, and the chorus of that song went like this. It went, looking for love in all the wrong places, looking for love in too many faces, searching the eyes and looking for traces of what I am dreaming of. Now, every once in a while, you'll hear that song. You'll be flipping through the radio, and here it will come. And the last time I heard that song, I got to thinking about this. Not about love, but I got to thinking about joy. That there are a whole lot of people who are looking for joy in all the wrong places. See, they're looking for joy in a whole bunch of places where they're never going to find it. See, they're looking for joy in the right situation or the right circumstance. They're looking for joy in the right job. If I just got the right job, man, I'd have so much joy. You know, if I, or the right relationship, or the right education, or if I get the right degree, or the right house, or the right vacation, I'll have joy. Man, if I find the right church, I'll have joy. But you got to understand, we start with this truth this morning, that joy is not based in your circumstance. Joy is not based in your situation. Joy is not based in what you have or what you don't have. Joy is a gift from God. Period. He is the, is the fruit of Holy Spirit. It is something He pours into us that He releases in us. You're not going to find joy in the world. You find joy in Jesus. Amen? And the reality is that when we have the right perspective, the right attitude, and when we're focused on Him, when we're focused on His plan and His direction, He begins to release joy in our lives. I'm not talking happiness. Come on now, happiness is based on your circumstance. Joy it supersedes all that, and we have joy when we, from the Lord. We've been talking about the wise men. Remember how they came? When they discovered Jesus, what did they do? They rejoiced with an exceedingly great joy, amen? It wasn't based on their circumstance, or it was based on the fact they had found Jesus. Man, we have found the Messiah. We have found the one. And they began to rejoice as joy began to be released in them. A powerful picture of joy. But I want you to understand that in the New Testament, as cool as that is, the Apostle Paul is the poster boy for joy. In fact, the book of Philippians, which he wrote, is called the book of joy. Now, you've got to understand, the book of Philippians, the letter he wrote to the church in Philippi, when he wrote that, he was in Rome, in prison, on death row. He was just waiting for his number to be called. And here he sets, and in four chapters, 16 times, Paul talks about the incredible joy he has in spite of his circumstance, in spite of his situation. And in chapter 1, Paul talks about, you know, some things that gave him great joy. He found great joy when he saw others seeking after Christ, when he saw others seeking to live the full life that Christ wanted them to live. You know, joy filled his heart when he saw people believing the Word and hearing the Word and proclaiming the Word, and when he saw them getting saved and transformed and their lives changed forever, it brought great joy to his heart. The Apostle Paul got great joy. He says, when I surrendered my life completely to the Lord, whether I live or die, whether I'm in prison or out of prison, no matter what happens to me, I am filled with joy because I know the Lord will be glorified in my life. Joy, amen? Joy in my life, pouring in and out of us. So here's the question we've got to start with this morning. Do those things bring joy in our lives? Do those things bring joy? When I see other people living for Jesus and fired up about Jesus and going all out for Jesus, is my heart filled with joy? When I see other people hearing the word, you know, believing the word, getting saved, being transformed, being restored, does it bring great joy to my heart? When I know that no matter what happens tomorrow, 
that because of my response, because of my faith, because of my love for Jesus, he will be exalted even in the midst of the mess. Does that bring me joy? See, we got to understand, Paul is clear here in chapter 1 that joy is released when it's not all about me. Joy is released when it's about the king and his kingdom. Listen to me. I believe that that's a critical truth for all of us as we face 2021. See, for too long the church has been about, no, no, it's really all about you. Kenny, don't you want to come to church here? Because, you know, whatever you want and however we want, whatever you need, man, we're just going to, we're going to, we're going to focus on you, brother. We're going to take care of you. And then when Kenny doesn't get what he wants, what's Kenny do? Kenny goes somewhere else looking for what? Why? Because we've made it all about Kenny and not about Jesus. Man, we want to see Kenny grow. We want to see Kenny blessed. We want to see good things happen. But listen, it's not about Kenny. And if we make it about us, we're not going to have joy. It's not going to happen. It's not going to take place. And so Paul goes on, and, and now he's ready for chapter 2. And Paul's about to talk about, he, he lays out that foundation in chapter 1, because now in chapter 2, he wants to talk about a new level of joy. A new level of joy. Look what he says. Therefore, verse chapter 2, verse 1, Therefore, if there is any encouragement, therefore, when you see a therefore, here's what you've got to ask. Why is the therefore there? All right? It's there because he says, everything I just told you in chapter 1, in light of all of that, now here's to be your response. Amen? Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there are any consolation of his love, if there is any, one, any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion. Paul says, in light of what I've just said, here are four rhetorical questions. Now, what's a rhetorical question? A question you already know the answer to. Amen? Lynn, are you going to have lunch today? Absolutely. <laughs> Rhetorical question. We all knew the answer before we ever asked it, right? That's what Paul's doing here. He knows what the answer is, all right? So let's look at those one at a time, all right? Here we go. He says, if there's any encouragement in Christ. Now, I want you to understand that's not a, feel, a statement about feeling good about Jesus. No, that's a statement that if, if you find encouragement in your intimacy, in your relationship, in being, if you're inspired by being in Christ, if you're motivated, encouraged, inspired to live for Him, to belong to Him, to follow Him, to be what He's created you to be, if that encouragement. So let me ask you, how many of us are doing what we do, say what we say, live the way we live, because of our relationship with Jesus, because of our love, because of our gratitude. Our life is based on our relationship with Jesus. We find encouragement in everything in life because of that. If that's true, he's talking about you. Paul's talking about you, all right? Number two, if there's any consolation of his love. You know what that means? Consolation only means comfort. If you find comfort in his love. If you find comfort being in Jesus' family, if you find comfort being a child of the king, then he's talking about you. Paul's talking about you. Do you find comfort in those things? Next he says, is there any fellowship of the Spirit? Now, fellowship is that Greek word koinonia that we talk about, and koinonia is not, hey, let's have coffee and let's high-five one another. Koinonia, the word literally means that, we're, that we come together, we, we join together, we encourage one another around a common mission. And what Paul's saying is, if you have any fellowship with Holy Spirit, if you're on the same page with Holy Spirit, if you're seeking out the leadership of Holy Spirit, if you're letting Holy Spirit direct your life, he says, I'm talking about you. I'm talking about you. And if you have any affection, now that word affection is an interesting Greek word because it means the innards. It means like the heart and, and the bowels and the liver and the lungs. Let me give you the Brian Wise translation. If you have a gut level, that's what it's talking about. If you have a gut level desire for the things of God. You say, what's that mean, Brian? Well, it means that, you know, when you see stuff, disobedience, when you see perversion, when you see the crap going on out there, there's something deep in you that is just stirred and hurts. Because guess what? Sin hurts the Father. Amen? He looks at this world and there's an ache. 
say, well, he's God. He's aching because he sees the destruction that's going on. And, and Paul's saying, is that in you? Do you feel that? Do you sense that? Uh, uh, there's a couple of particular issues we won't go into, but I tell you what, I watch my wife get grieved on a regular basis because she sees stuff. And it's just like, oh, there's something in her that's just, I, it just grieves her. There's something in me that is grieved by things that I see and hear. Why? Because there's that affection for the things of the Lord. And then the last thing is, is he said compassion. That just means a deep passion for the things of God. A deep love for the things of God. That my life is focused on the things of the Lord. And I have just this, this driving passion in me. That's the picture he's painting. And so I just want to stop here for a moment. We don't normally do this, but I, want, I think it's important this morning. I want us to kind of make an assessment, because Paul's about to use what we've just talked about as a launching pad for the next level. How many of you know if you don't have a good base level, jumping ain't going to do you any good? Amen? Launching off of, you know, quicksand is not going to get you anywhere. Amen? Do we have a good strong base level? So in your notes, there's, a, there's, there's four questions here and a slot for you to put your answer, all right? If you've got a pen, I encourage you to bring your pen when you come to church, because you might have to write something, amen? Come on, say amen. Come on. There might be something you need to write down. All right, so here's statement number one, and we're going to rank these on a scale of one to ten. One being absolutely no, it's not true. Ten being completely true, all right? Are you ready? Here we go. Here's number one. My motivation in life is to live the life God has created me to live. My driving force in life is to live the life that God has created me to live. I get out of bed in the morning. My motivation for getting up is to live the life God created me to live. On a scale of 1 to 10, where are you? Now, hey, be honest. You're in church. Well, my neighbor might see. Well, hold your hand over it if you need to, all right? Jesus already knows. Amen? He already knows what number you are. All right? No sense hiding it. All right? Number, statement number two. Knowing I am loved by God and being in God's family is enough for me. I mean, all hell is going to break loose tomorrow, and everything's going to happen, and it's all going to, you know, it's going to seem like a flood rolled into your life, but you're okay because being loved by God and being a part of his family is enough. Scale one to ten. We're being honest, right? right man? Statement number three. I live in fellowship and cooperation with Holy Spirit on a daily basis. I live, I'm seeking the direction and the leadership of Holy Spirit every single day in my life to do what it is God wants me to do. Scale 1 to 10. Number 4. I have a deep gut level passion for the things of God. Scale 1 to 10. Man, the things of God, man, just burn in me. All right. So, I want you to look at your list there, all right? And I want you to ask yourself this question. Where were you five years ago on that list? <laughs> okay. Our sister wants to be honest. She says it's lower than it is today. How about a year ago? How, see, what I want us to understand is it's not what our score is, it's am I making progress? Come on now. Am I growing? It, you know, listen, life in the kingdom is about the process, not just I'm jumping there. When we all like to have tens, when we all just like to ace it, I got 100%, Pastor. Well, good for you. Your pastor probably didn't get 100%. Listen, we're in progress. And the more important question is, where do you want to be a year from now? See, it's God comes and he says, I want to work in your life to draw you into these things. And as he does, greater joy is going to come in our own personal lives. It's going to happen in us, and that joy is going to be released. And he wants to build that. Amen? He wants to do that in your life and do it in my life. But I do that because Paul now wants to leave the focus on us individually and look at us as a group. See, when we go to the next level of joy, 
It's definitely not about us. It's about everybody else. It's about him. Because Paul says, if there's any encouragement in Christ, if there's any consolation of his love, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, if there's any affection and compassion, verse 2, then, then. All right, because of those things, then, this is how you're to respond. You ready? Make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united and intent on one purpose. I want you to understand, Paul's about to supersize our joy. Come on, anybody ever go through the drive-thru and supersize it? I used to, I'm not allowed right now. Maybe one day I'll get to supersize it again. But the reality is, we like to supersize it. Paul's like, hey, I'm just going to supersize your, your joy right here. He says, and here's how it's going to happen. Number one, being of the same mind. Being of the same mind. Now, what's that mean? See, greater joy is released when we're in unity with one another. Greater joy is released in unity as in our families, unity in our church, unity in the body of Christ, unity in our community, unity in our country releases incredible joy. You want to know why they're in the joy in this country right now? Because there's no unity. Come on, there's nothing but division. Division destroys joy. Amen? Absolutely. He says, okay, so how do you do that? Being of one mind. Being of one mind. Having the same viewpoint. Having the same understanding. That means having the mindset in the same direction. What direction is that, Brian? Well, it's the direction of the king. It's the direction of the kingdom. It's the direction that God desires to go, not we desire to go. Amen? Listen, we're never going to find unity in all of our desires where we want to go. You're only going to find unity if we're in the same mind on what God wants to do. Amen? That's the only place you're going to find unity. See, most of us in this room are citizens of the kingdom of heaven. And the reality is, as sons and daughters, as prince and princesses, as co-heirs of Christ, what, what's to be our focus? Our focus is to be on his perspective, on his understanding, on the things he desires to do. That's our focus. Prairie Grove Christian Church, what's our focus to be? It's to be on what it is God wants to do. It's unity in what he desires. Unity in what he's doing. It is sameness of mind in what he's up to. See, see, the direction is not, well, Brian thinks we ought to go this way, or the trustees think we ought to go this way, or the deacons think we ought to go this way. He's given us leaders, but ultimately the issue is where's God want to go? What's God want to do? See, that's where we find unity, and when we are of the same mind, we begin to find joy. But not only should we have the same mind, he says, I want you to maintain the same love. The same love. Share the same affection. Share the same concern of God's love for one another. Because listen, he says it doesn't matter who or where or what, we are to share the same love for one another. Regardless of our economic situation, whether or not we are homeless or poor, whether or not we are lower class or middle class or upper class, no matter whether we're so-called one percenters, it doesn't matter. We're to love one another the same. It doesn't matter whether we have educational differences. You know, I never graduated high school. I got a GED. I'm a high school graduate, college graduate. I got an advanced degree. I got some doctorates behind my name. None of that matters. We are to love the same. That it doesn't matter where we come from or, or what we do. It doesn't matter our skin color. What Jesus, that little song we learned, yellow, red or yellow, black and white, they're all precious in his sight. It doesn't matter what, what skin color, what ethnicity we come from. Whether we're Native American or African American or Hispanic or Asian or Chinese or white, we are to love one another the way God loves us. He said, be of the same love. It doesn't matter whether we're 80-something or 60-something, or 40-something, or 20-something, or teenagers, or children, we're all to be loved the same. And the reality is, there's incredible diversity in that. And because of that incredible diversity, we're never going to find the same mind unless we have the same love, and we're all focused in the same direction. Let's be honest. All right, can, can we be honest in church? All right, I'm going to make it easy. If you're over 70, raise your hand this year, today. All right, look around. That's, that's, ha that's half of us. All right, over 70. All right? 
That's okay. That's great. Er, Earl kind of like, oh, oh, sh- you, oh, another week. Okay, well, we'll, we'll give you a half boat then. <laughs> the reality is we're not all going to see things the same way based on age. Amen? When you're 70 and above, you see things a certain way. That's okay. That's good. But listen, when you're 20-something, you see them a little different. How do you take 70-somethings and 20-somethings and bring them together? It's got to be in love, and it's got to be on a common focus and a common mind of what are we really about. And what are we really about? The things that God's about. Amen? It may look a little different how we manifest that, but the goal and the focus is the same. And Paul says incredible joy comes out of that. Then he says united in spirit. United with Holy Spirit. Being led by Holy Spirit. Closely united with. You know, the Brian Wise translation again is we're all operating on the same page. Amen? Have you ever worked in the factory and you weren't on the same page? Come on, Earl, Earl's been in the factory. Ever been at work and everybody wasn't on the same page? It's a little tough. Sarah, you're a leader at the hospital. Everybody on the same page all the time. How nice is it when we're on the same page? It's beautiful when we're on the same page. Listen, if we're going to be all God wants us to be, we've we got to find a common page. Amen? And the only common page going to work is his page, not my page, not your page. Amen? You know, that's the picture we have to find. That's where we find unity. And, and then, intent on one purpose. And that really means the same thing as being in one mind. We're all headed in the same direction. Anybody... Anybody here old enough to drive horses? Rich, I'm not picking out on your age, Rich, but you, you drive, ever drive horses? Nope, okay. If you ever drove horses and you're trying to plow with horses, which I never did, but my grandfather would talk about it. You know, if I've got a team of four horses and I got one that wants to go this way and I got one that wants to go that way and I want one to stop and one wants to run ahead, how much plowing am I going to get done? I'm going to get nothing done. Why? Because I'm going to spend all our time trying to go 14 directions. But when those four horses come together and they come into agreement, and what? They all pull in the same direction with the common purpose of we're going to pull this plow and we're going to pull it to the other end of the field. Guess what? Incredible stuff can happen. But there's got to be this unity. There's got to be this picture of coming together around the common purpose and focus that God has for our lives. Think about this. We've got to be of the same mind. We've got to be of the same spirit, same love, one purpose. And we see that happening. A husband and wife. If a husband and wife, listen, have the same, what? Are of one mind, of the same love, of the same purpose, and are working together, helping one another to fulfill a common goal, a common direction, incredible joy is in that marriage. But if a husband and wife are on two different pages, if a husband and wife, you know, the wife's going this way and the husband's going this way, and they're not operating at one, man, that's a, that's a miserable marriage. Amen? That's what Paul's talking about here. Or you think about a family. Man, you got mom and dad and kids, and they're all going in different directions. Well, here's what I want to do, and here's what's important to me, and you know, not operating together. I tell you what, a family that operates together is able to accomplish incredible things. Amen? I, I watch Amish, I've been fascinated with the Amish for years. And when I go to the market and when I go to the auction, I go by and here out in the field are 10, 12 kids, all operating on what page? One page, all working together. You say, well, how can they make it? Because they know how to find unity. Is it perfect? No, it's not perfect. Please don't hear that. But listen, we're all going to work together because if we work together, man, we will thrive. If we don't, we'll die. Amen? Listen, Prairie Grove Christian Church, that's just true for us and anybody else. We all work together, we're going to thrive. If we don't, we're not going to make it. We're not going to make it. The power of unity. God wants to release us. And you say, well, we, why is that so hard, Pastor? That sounds really great, but, but that's hard. How many want to vote hard? Come on. Oh, we only got about half of you are honest. Okay, that's hard. That's hard. Why? Why? Well, number one, because everything in the world around us screams the opposite. 
our culture wants nothing to do with unity. You got, Jim, just do your own thing, girl. Come on. <laughs> Come on. You go do your thing, and Linda, you go do your thing, and Pat, you do your thing, and, you know, we can't come together because we all, we're all different. That's what the culture says. Just be yourself. Be everything that you want to be. Don't think about anybody else. Or what about our politics? You want to know why we got 20,000 National Guard troops in Washington, D.C.? We don't, because we don't understand unity. We don't understand finding a common page. You, you want to know why the church is such, so weak and, and such a mess? Not our church. I'm talking the church in general. You know why? Because we're all divided up. Why? Because we can't come together. We got, got 2,000 denominations. We got people who can't play with one another. Why? Because we can't agree. We can't find unity. There's no power in that. The devil laughs at the church and he says, well, if you guys would just get your act together and come together, you kick my butt and take some names. But you're too busy fighting with one another over stuff that doesn't matter. I tell you what, my good friend Ron Meyer, you know Ron, he's been here. Ron and I, man, we, 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 go, we meet every week and we talk about the deep things of the Lord. Do you know that Ron and I don't agree on everything? There's a lot of things we don't agree on. But that doesn't mean we can't get together and do, and do incredible things together. Amen? Listen, we've got to find unity. The devil wants to keep us apart. The devil wants to destroy our joy by keeping us out of unity. And, and now the second reason is this. Here it is, you ready? Because deep down inside, what I really want is what I want. Come on, let's just be honest. I really want the thing I want, and I want it the way I want it, and I really like to do it this way. I, you know, I, I, me. And I want to tell you that I'll kill you. Amen? Listen, it's done a, word, it's done a number on the church. Brendan and I joke all the time, look at a lot of modern Christian worship songs. There's a lot of great worship songs, but there's also a lot of them that got I in every sentence. I want this, and I need this, and I want you to do this, and listen, that's not worship. That's focus on me. Worship is focus on him. Amen? We're going to talk about that in a couple weeks. We'll get started on worship, but after we get through joy. So you say, okay, it's hard. Amen? Can we all those hard? And... and, and a lot of times we haven't done it real well. Can we, can we at least confess that? So, so how do we do this? How, how do we begin to find unity? How do we begin to step into what God wants us to be, this unity that's going to release incredible joy? Well, here's number one. Look what he says in verse three. Paul's really good, man. Look what he says. Do nothing. Do nothing. Pat, help me. When Paul says do nothing, he means do a few things. Do some things. Do absolute, no, no, he doesn't mean some or few. He means absolutely zero, zilch, nada, all right? Null, all right? Do absolutely nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regarding one another as important, more important than yourself, do not merely look out for your own personal interest, but also for the interest of others. Ouch. Pastor, could we just skip those? Could we just skip those verses? Could, could we just like put those, maybe we should just go home now. Listen, one of the things that's happened to us as the church of Jesus Christ is we come to passages like this and we call it. We say, well, that's too tough. Listen to me. We've got to deal with the whole word. Well, I like these passages. Well, I like some passages too. But there's some I don't like a lot, but I got to deal with them anyway, right? And so what's he say? We've got to look at them. Number one, do nothing, nothing from selfishness. I like the New Living Translation that says, don't be selfish. Very simply, the Word of God says, do not be selfish. Well, that's a hard one. Amen? Everything in the world tells us to be selfish. Everything in the world tells us to look after number one, take care of ourselves, get yours. I watched a commercial, saw a commercial the other night, this, this woman, this, you know, 20, 30-something said, I'm going to get mine. I'm going to get mine. Come on. That's not the attitude. That's not the attitude. Do nothing focused on me. Do, out of selfishness, do nothing out of empty conceit. That, that word empty conceit literally means you don't draw attention to yourself. Don't be trying to get the focus on you. Come on. Anybody got, you know, young grandchildren, great-grandchildren, you know, and all they want is your attention? 
And they run around all the time doing stuff to basically say, look at me, look at me, look at me, pay attention to me, focus on me. That's what Paul's saying. He's saying, don't do that. We're adults. We're sons and daughters of the king. We don't have to run around begging for his attention. Listen, he's got our, he, we have his attention. We don't need the world's attention. We don't need other, other people's attention. Amen? He says, stop that. Instead, he says, here's what you ought to be doing. Regard other people as more important than yourself. Ouch. Regard other people as more important. Their needs, their desires, their dreams, their lives are more important than your life. Well, that won't preach. Well, we don't want to hear that. Paul says, if you want to find unity, start thinking about other people. You've got to start thinking about somebody beside yourself. Think about that. In a marriage. You know how many couples I've married who come in for premarital counseling and they told me, well, pastor, we believe that marriage is 50-50. And you know what they get? The big, eh! That's a lie of the world. That's not what the book says. You know what the book says about marriage? It says, here's how, here's how the husbands and wives are to treat one another. They are to love each other with an agape love. You know what agape really means? Sacrificial. You don't understand what sacrificial really means? That means you before me. I'm going to put your needs and your desires and your dreams and your stuff ahead of my stuff as a husband. And as a wife, I'm going to put his needs and his desires and his dreams ahead. And the picture is that there are two people humbling themselves, pouring themselves out of the other, and as they humble themselves and pour into the other, they're exalting the other. They get exalted because of their humility. Do you understand how it works in the kingdom? If you want to go up, you've got to go down. If you want to get higher, you've got to get lower. That is a kingdom principle. We don't get higher by trying to climb the ladder. We get higher by getting down and humbling ourselves and let God exalt us. What does it say about Jesus? That Jesus humbled himself on the cross. We'll talk about more next week. Humbled himself on the cross. And, and what happened? God exalted him to the highest position. Listen, Jesus didn't make himself king of kings and lord of lords. The Father made him king of kings and lord of lords. Why? Because he got down. He humbled himself. Man, it's getting quiet in here, and the looks are like, God loves us so much, he says, I want to give you the secret. I want to give you the secret of truly joy. But then he goes on and says, do not merely look out for your own interest, but also for the interest of others. He says, you know what? There's an appropriate level of, folk, of, of dealing with yourself. But listen, don't let that get in the way of focusing on others. Focusing on what God has for you. Focusing on the desire He has for your life. Focusing on what He's up to. That we might come together in something common. We might come together in something beautiful. You say, well, Brian, that just really sounds impossible. That really sounds like, I'm not sure we can pull that off. I'm not sure that that's not too far outside the box for any of us. And you know what? Paul understood your concern. He knew that's what the Philippians were going to say. And so in verse 5, he begins to answer it. Now, we're going to look in detail next week at this, all right? But I just want to read it to you this week, all right? In verse 5, he says, In your relationships with one another. Turn to your neighbor and say, he's talking about us. He's talking about us, Amen. Talking about in your relationship with one another. He's talking about Prairie Grove Christian Church. Amen. Have the same mindset. Some of your translations say the same attitude as Jesus Christ. Have the same attitude. Same focus. Verse 7. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. That Jesus humbled himself. Jesus went down, amen, in, in, in relationship to the, what the Father had asked of him, amen? It wasn't Jesus' plan, it was the Father's plan, amen? Therefore, verse 9, 
God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, and at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Listen to me, friends. If we want incredible joy, if we want greater joy, if we want greater unity, if we want to walk in those things, it's going to require us to have the same mindset. It's going to require us to have the same attitude. It's going to require us to have the same desire. Require us to have the same perspective that Jesus had. He's our example. He's our example. That we would humble ourselves. That we would come together and lay our things aside and say, Lord, we're taking our things off the table and putting your thing in the middle of the table. See, that's true in my personal life. That's true in our marriage. That's true in your family. It's true in this church. It's true in the big C church. And it's true in this country. Can I take my stuff off the table and put his stuff in the center? When I am willing to do that, unity breaks out, and with unity comes joy greater joy joy beyond what we can even imagine say brian that's tough it is tough but how many of you know we didn't sign up for an easy journey when you put your faith in jesus he didn't say oh hey this is just going to be a cakewalk come on come on earl cakewalk no he said i got something far greater for you than the world has for you amen he wants you to have great joy he wants you to have exceedingly great joy he wants us to be able to rejoice with an exceedingly great joy. Because listen, what have, I, what have I said? The greatest joy in life is what? Knowing that I'm engaged in what God created me to do. Amen. Notice that, what God created me to do. God created me to do. God created me to do. And we just simply have to begin to say, Lord, what is it that you have for me? What have you got for me this afternoon? Lord, what have you got for me today? Well, you know the game's on, Brian. Lord, what have you got? Well, you know, I, 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 Lord, what do you got? Well, I, Lord, what do you got? What are you up to? What do you desire? And listen to me, when we begin to tap into those things, what happens? And there's just something that wells up in us, and it's called joy. And it's a gift that God gives. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your word, and and Lord, I ask that you would just lead us today. Holy Spirit, just take this word, Lord, this hard word, this tough word, in the beginning of this year, and begin to massage it, Lord, into our hearts. Begin to just take it like oil and begin to rub it into our spirit and rub it into our heart and rub it into our mind. Lord, just begin to anoint us with your truth. Holy Spirit, just begin to speak that into us. Your word says, Lord, that the Holy Spirit is the one who will teach us all things. Teach us the deep truths, Lord. For, Lord, our desire, our desire is to be one with you. Our desire is to be one with one another. Our desire is to be one as a church. Our desire is to be all that you've created us to be. Not for our glory, but for yours. We just thank you, Father, and we give you glory and praise now in your mighty name. Amen.